What's left for us to look at is to look back at the interplay in between radical expressions, so expressions that use that radical symbol, the square root is one example, and how those relate to rational exponents. So what we want to do is figure out how to connect what we know about radicals back with what we know about exponents. Because if we can do that, then we have a bunch of machinery back from topic number six in how to simplify expressions that have exponents in them. So we want to be able to connect and bridge those two worlds. This is also going to be especially important when you move along to calculus, because it turns out in calculus that we can do a lot in calculus with expressions that are written in terms of exponents, where it turns out we can't do a whole lot with them when they're written with radicals. Um, so this is going to give us a dictionary in between those two worlds so that we can translate from here over to there, um, and then also occasionally from there back to here. Right, so to get our dictionary, we really need to, we really need to translate in both directions. Right? It's like when you get those old foreign language dictionaries, Italian, English, and English, Italian. Right? So we want to be able to do both. Um, so the first thing that we'll talk about is how to go in the direction of radicals to exponents. So how do we think about a radical expression, whether it's an expression with a number underneath or whether it has some variable expression underneath it? How do we rethink of it uh, in terms of uh, an exponent instead? So I want to start actually with the first example that's on here and kind of unpack it uh, with some detail. How do we think of the square root of 25 as 25 raised to some power? So first, I just want to ask the obvious question. What is the square root of 25? It's 5. So that's the obvious question. The less obvious question is how do we know? Why is the square root of 25 equal to 5? Because 5 times 5 is 25, so let me unpack that for a minute. So just to get us some space underneath for the moment. Square root of 5, sorry, square root of 25 is equal to 5 because 5 squared is equal to 25. That's the mental logic that we're used to thinking about when we compute square roots. It becomes almost automatic in our brain. But I want to slow down that automatic process for a second because we can discover a new principle out of it. The fact that 5 squared is equal to 25 <coughs> means that if we treat this 5 as though it's an unknown variable for a second, if we treat the 5 like it's an x, let's imagine that what I'm trying to do in this equation is to rearrange this equation to get the x, the 5, by itself. So I want to get the square off of my 5 by doing something to both sides. So on the one hand, what I would do to both sides of this equation if I wanted to get the 5 by itself is I would just take the square root, obviously. right? That's, that's just a tautology. That's just restating what it was that got us from here to there. But I want to think about this in a slightly different way. Um, and this is going to be what connects us back to the uh, algebra of exponents for a second. I want to somehow get from this line to the next line by raising both sides to a power. In other words, what I'd like to do is put some power here and here. It had better be the same power because I'm applying it to both sides of an equation that I would like to remain a true equation um, afterwards, as it is in the beginning. And the question is, what power do I want to put here that's going to turn 5 squared into 5? So my first question, I guess, is, what is the secret exponent that's sitting here on this 5? If I don't write an exponent on a quantity, what secret exponent is actually there? One. One, exactly. There's our hidden exponent on the 5. So now we've sharpened the question a little bit to say, what power should I put here? What power should I raise 5 squared to, 5 to the 2? What power should I put there so that the result, when I simplify it, becomes 5 to the power 1? And the key to answering that question is to remind ourselves, how do we raise a power to a power? What happens to the exponents when we raise a power to a power? A month ago, uh, we first were introduced to these properties of exponents. And one of them told us what happens when we raise a power to a power. Right? What, in fact, happens to the exponents when we take a power and raise it to another power? They multiply, exactly. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do in this equation, which we're going to try and use 
to determine how to convert a radical into an exponent. So when we raise a power to a power, those exponents multiply. And so what I end up getting on the left side of this equation is 5 raised to the power 2 times whatever I put in that blank. Right? And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to have 25 raised to that blank. And those two things are going to be equal. And so then the only question becomes, 2 multiplied by what is going to equal 1? How would you answer that question? If I call that power x for a second. Yeah, exactly. Just divide both sides of this equation by 2. x is 1 half. So the power that I want in this little purple box is the power 1 half. Because when I raise a second power to a 1 half power, those exponents multiply 2 times 1 half and leave me with an exponent of 1. And that's my invisible exponent. That's the exponent which gets my quantity by itself, which is what we wanted in the first place. And so what we find out, now the, the, the takeaway here, is actually what we see on the right-hand sides of this last pair of equations. On the one hand, we have the square root of 25. On the other hand, we have 25 raised to the power 1 half. And those two, by the very construction of how we arrived at this equation, those two are exactly the same thing. So what we might say, for starters, <coughs> is that taking the square root of a quantity, any quantity, not just 25, taking the square root of anything is the same thing as raising that thing to what power? One half. That's probably the most important version of this takeaway for when you go to calculus later on, right, two semesters from now. Um, because there are a lot of calculus problems that you do that involve square roots. And before you can actually do anything calculus -y with them, you'll convert those square roots into exponents of 1 half. Most common radical to fractional exponent conversion uh, in all of analysis. Um, and this, is, this work over here is a specific example of where that truism comes from. So if we go back for a moment and sort of fill in our little chart on where we're going here, 25 to the 1 half power is another way of writing the square root of 25. And therefore, x to the 1 half power, because the argument works exactly the same if it's x instead of 25. Um, x to the 1 half power is the square root of x. So by the way, that also equips us to do this problem over here on the right. If I gave you 81 to the 1 half power, what's that going to be equal to? one to the one half power is the same as well according to this 81 to the one half power is the same thing as the square root of 81 and what is the square root of 81 nine, nine. right so that's the other great thing about this uh, this property here is that it's not just something that helps us to rewrite an expression just for its own sake it also tells us how to raise numbers to fractional powers how do I raise 81 to the power 1 half? I can't multiply it by itself 1 half time. That doesn't make sense. But what I can do is convert it over into its, ration, or, sorry, its radical version. 81 to the 1 half is the same as the square root of 81. And we know, based on our backwards thinking, right, we know that the square root of 81 is equal to 9, because 9 squared is equal to 81. Let's push that a step further by looking next at this problem. This is not a square root anymore, um, but it's a 64 with a fourth root on top of it. So let's just think for a moment about what that means. How would I know, or how would I go about trying to find out what the fourth root of 64 is? What would we be looking for? Yeah, a number times itself, how many times, though? four times. Right. So we're looking for a number which multiplied by itself with a total of four factors is equal to 64. So what times itself times itself times itself is equal to 64? Well, what do you think? I mean, we can just kind of hazard a guess. 
These are a little harder to do. They require some more gymnastics. One way to think about it would be to think of it first as a square root problem. What times itself once is equal to 64? 8. So So now we can kind of reframe this to say, whatever this number is, when I multiply it by itself, I should get 8. So x squared should be equal to 8. So what does that make x? x times x has to equal 8. So x is the square root of 8. I didn't choose this problem particularly well, because I don't get a very nice answer out of it at the end. Square root of 8 is some nasty decimal. It's 2 point. Uh, 2.828 dot dot dot. Um, okay, so that's, that's not a particularly great answer. Um, but it doesn't matter for the sake of our conversation right now what that number is. What we're trying to figure out is how to rewrite it in terms of a fractional power. So whatever the fourth root of 64 is, whatever the fourth root of 64 is, if we call it x, then it has to be a solution to the equation x to the fourth is equal to 64. And so if we play the same game about how do I get this x by itself by raising both sides of this equation to a power, so I'm going to put my unknown power up here, then what power do I want to fill in this blank if the goal is now that when I multiply this power by 4, I'm going to get 1? How do you want to fill in the box this time? Yeah. One fourth. And so then again, looking at the right hand sides here, the fourth root of 64 needs to be the same thing as 64 raised to the one fourth power. And so the pattern that we see beginning to emerge is that taking a radical with a higher index, so the square root has an implicit index sitting here in the crook of the radical, an implicit 2 there. We don't usually write it, but if we wanted to, we could write a 2 there. Um, whereas my fourth root here has a little index of 4 here, that index seems to transform into the denominator of the fraction that we have in our exponent. And so we can make this rule that we have up here in the upper right, we can make it a little bit more general. We can say x raised to the power, not a over b, but let me write this as x to the 1 over b for a minute. x to the 1 over b is the same thing as the bth root of x. So if I want to convert a fourth root, I'll have one fourth. If I have a square root, it becomes one half. Um, what would z to the one third turn into? Yeah, it would be a three on the index of the radical and a z underneath. We call that the cubed root of z. Right. Um, so the index of the radical and the denominator of the fractional exponent agree with one another. That's the, the b's in this example. The last thing I want to look at then is <clears throat> what if I have a fraction in my exponent which doesn't have a 1 as the numerator? Like what if I have something like this one, 81 to the power of 3 fourths? Um, let's think about what that, uh, what we might be able to do with that. Here's the, here's the clever trick for something like 81 to the 3 fourths. My trick is, if I know how to raise something to the one-fourth power, then let's take the opportunity to break apart the one-fourth power and the three. Because after all, three-fourths is nothing more than one-fourth times three. Right? We could check that just by using fraction multiplication. And making this into a multiplication of powers means that I can actually travel the road of my exponent properties, I can travel that road backwards. In other words, since I know that taking a power of a power is the same thing as multiplying powers to get multiplying exponents together, I can travel that road backwards to rewrite this uh, multiplication in the exponent as a power of a power. And if I use that observation, I can rewrite 81 to the 1 fourth times 3 as 81 to the 1 4th raised to the power 3.
And what that allows me to do is to, is to separate the two questions. First of all, how do I raise 81 to the power 1 fourth? And then separately, how do I raise that quantity to the power 3? So let's first think about what is 81 to the 1 fourth? Well, it's the fourth root of 81, right? Which is a number that if I multiply it by itself four times, I'm going to get 81. What's your guess? The hint there is if I multiply twice, each of those needs to be a number which multiplies by itself to give me 81. What number multiplied by itself gives me 81? 9. And so the product of these first two factors has to be 9. The product of these first two factors has to be 9. So the fourth root of 81 is the same thing as the second root, the square root, of 9. And what's the square root of 9? There we go. So the fourth root of 81 is equal to 3. And so 81 to the 3 fourths, I'm going to take and write over here, it's the fourth root of 81, the quantity cubed. So that's 3, according to the work we just did, cubed. And what's 3 cubed? What do I get if I multiply 3 by itself uh, 3 times? 27. 3 times 3 is 9, times another 3 is 27. So a fractional exponent that has a, a, a not a unit numerator, so here I had a 3 up in the numerator instead of a 1, it just becomes a two-step process um, of we can first take the root that's suggested by the denominator, so 81 to the 1 fourth was the fourth root of 81, that gave me my 3, and then subsequently raise that power to the power designated by the numerator. So first take the root and then take a power of your answer. So that's one way of looking at it. And I think from a computational perspective, it's the most simple way of looking at it. Um, but I made a choice, actually, right here. When I wrote 1 fourth times 3, and then I took the 1 fourth inside the parentheses and wrote the, the third power on the outside, I could have done it in the opposite order. So let's think of an alternate universe here, where instead of 1 fourth times 3, I could think of it instead as 3 times 1 fourth. Those two are the same, after all. If I did it that way, then what that indicates is that I'm actually taking the third power of 81 first, and then I'm taking the fourth root of the answer. This is the road not traveled. And the reason we didn't travel it in this example is that I don't feel particularly like raising 81 to the power 3. I don't want to multiply 81 times 81 times 81 any more than you do. Um, and then trying to take the fourth root of that, that sounds like a nightmare. Um, and yet, this expression needs to be exactly the same as that expression. So I just want to put this out there because it's another way to think about how this radical might look if we see it in an expression in a different way. So the 3 fourths power of 81 is also the same thing as the fourth root of the third power of 81. And we can really see it either way. And this way of seeing it actually lends itself to the more general principle of how to interpret a fractional exponent. If it's x to the a over b, that's the same thing as the bth root of the ath power of x. So if we meet an expression that looks like this, the, the sort of the simplified way of writing it in algebra is it's the bth root of the ath power. But note that that's exactly the same thing as the ath power of the bth root, which when it comes time to actually compute is the easier way to think about it. So that indicates, for example, that the square root of y to the fifth is going to equal what? Let's do that problem on the lower left. What's the, by the way, what's the secret index on the radical outside here? What does a square root get? Yeah, it gets a 2. And so given that there's a secret little 2 out there on my radical, what fraction should I get here as the power of y, which is equivalent to the second root of y to the fifth? 5 over 2. Perfect. Great. And then conversely, to fill in the last problem, x to the power 7 eighths is going to be x underneath the radical. And then where is the 8 going to go? Outside. It's the index of my radical. And the 7? It's the exponent on my x on the inside. Yep, there we go. And so that now is a complete rendition of what it means to raise a quantity or a number to a fractional exponent. The denominator of that fraction 
ends up being the index of my radical, and the numerator is the power that the whole thing, or equivalently, just the quantity underneath, the radicand, is being raised to. The bth root of x to the a, or the ath power of the bth root of x, is what we mean by x to the a over b.